Okay, well, uh, it's good again to be back. And uh, once again, we trust the Lord will bless our time together. Um, it is maybe just helpful to remind ourselves that we're, we're looking at the foundations of reality, as Andrew has been saying. And uh, the reason that's helpful is because uh, many of the subjects that we are speaking about, um, we're, we're not really, we don't just have the time to, to enlarge upon the subject the whole way through scripture. So we're looking at the foundation of things and um, we're hoping that that will prove uh, encouraging to us. So we've thought a lot about God over the past few days and uh, in the section today, my section, we're focusing upon man. Uh, man's dignity, uh, the image of God. And I want to read a, a passage with you briefly. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, we'll read from verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, uh, there's, there's much more that, that could be read in this part of Genesis, but, but time really wouldn't permit us to deal with it. So I'd encourage anyone wishing to know more about man to study these early chapters of, of Genesis thoroughly. A, a proper understanding of God is uh, obviously essential to understanding reality, but uh, so also is a proper understanding of man. David, uh, the psalmist, asked the question in Psalm number eight, what is man? And of course, that's an important question to answer. In the different worldviews, the answer to this question usually results in man either being demeaned or being deified. Uh, a common view that demeans man is uh, materialism. Now, that's the, the, the philosophy of the atheist normally. Those who believe that nothing more than matter exists. Uh, and this view removes from man any value or meaning or purpose. Carl Sagan said, we emerged from microbes and muck. Uh, Bill Nye has said, we're just a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck in the corner of a speck, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I think it was Peter Atkins who said, we are just slime on a planet. Thus, in the view of materialism, man is of no more value than, than a dog. Another view deifies man. Eastern religions, New Age religions, for example, say, say that, that you, a human being, are God. Uh, as one proponent of this view has written, you are God in a physical body. You are spirit in the flesh. You are eternal life expressing itself. You are a cosmic being. You are all power, all wisdom, all intelligence, perfection, magnificence. I remember speaking to a girl about the gospel and telling her that the Lord Jesus was God. And she had no problem believing that. I thought, well, this is great. Until I learned that uh, she also thought that she was God and uh, that, that I was God. So some common ideas about man result in man either being demeaned or deified. But the biblical view of man certainly matches more with the world in which we live. It acknowledges both the dignity and the depravity of man. Both are beauty and our brokenness and in doing so it, it differentiates man both from god and from the rest of creation so man is viewed from the beginning as having both a downward and an upward relationship he stands between god the creator and the world the creation he possesses a, a personality which makes him like god but he is finite 
which makes him like the rest of creation. Now, as we consider man's dignity then, keep in mind that Paul is going to be looking tomorrow at man's depravity. So uh, considering man's dignity, I want to consider two subjects. First of all, I want to think of man representing God. And uh, they're going to think about the value of man. And then I want to think about man resembling God. I'm going to think there about the virtues or the qualities of man. So man representing God, first of all. Now, uh, these verses that we have read uh, declare that man has been made in God's image and with his likeness. And it's important just to note that this applies specifically both to the male and to the female. Now, these words image and likeness are, are quite difficult to distinguish decisively with respect to their meaning. But any difference that does exist seems to suggest that the image refers to a, a representation, something like a statue, whereas likeness is more abstract and, and refers just generally to resemblance. So man, according to this divine conversation, uh, was to have a unique identity and status in creation. He was to represent God and in some senses to resemble God. So first let's think about man in God's image as representing God. And we'll ask what that means and then why it matters. Well, what does it mean to represent God? In the ancient Near East, it was common apparently for, for a king to have images made of him. And these images were statues and they were, they were placed in parts of the kingdom. And uh, they served as reminders to the people of the king's sovereign authority. Now, the value or importance of these images lay in the king that they represented. So an attack upon an image of a king would be construed, obviously, as an attack against the king's authority, an attack upon the king himself. Now, in the same way, God is saying that man has been placed in this world as his representative. The sovereign God, who is the king over all the earth, has placed man in the world to represent him in his physical absence. So, Man has this unique value, and uh, to devalue or to attack man is regarded as an affront against his creator. Now, this is confirmed for us in Genesis chapter 9. God had brought Noah and his family through the flood in the ark, and when they come out onto dry land again, God restates, re restate, restates the, the duty that man has to, to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then God speaks to, to, to Noah about the animal kingdom. And he confirms that man can kill animals for food, but that any animal who kills a man has forfeited its life. It is to be killed. So clearly the value of the human being is seen to exceed that of the animal. And then he goes further. He says in verses seven and eight, he says, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So God placed into the hand of human beings the authority to judge the sin of murder. Uh, the punishment required was nothing less than capital punishment. But, but why was that? Well, what God wanted to do was to communicate just how serious this crime was. So the severity of the punishment for murder was intended to convey the severity of the crime of, of murder. So to take the life of a human being was to forfeit one's own right to life. Now, of course, there are many arguments that can be marshaled against capital punishment. And uh, uh, they, these may resonate with, with, with some of us, but, but let's just ask why God commanded it at the beginning. 
it was because murder is the ultimate rebellion against God. It is the deliberate destruction of God's representative on earth. Uh, and to minimize punishment then for that crime is to minimize the crime itself and ultimately to show disrespect for the creator. You see, people destroy images because they hate what the image represents. If you happened upon a picture of the queen and it had been defaced, you wouldn't think that the person who did it held any respect for the queen. In very recent times, uh, both here and in the United States, there's been a spate of uh, the destruction of, of statues. Uh, and these images, they represent historical figures and they've been defaced or removed and some of them have been destroyed. Now, why was that done? Well, because the people who did it wished to express their antagonism against the person the image represented or against what the image represented. So man is made in God's image. He represents God. And so any devaluing of man is to be regarded as an attack upon God. The fact is that the devaluation of human life runs in tandem with rebellion against divine authority. And we see this principle through its scripture. For, for example, in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 31, we, we read this. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him, that is, honors God. Here we have a person who wouldn't normally be valued much on earth, the poor man. However, he's regarded by God as valiant. And God takes personally as against himself the mistreatment of the poor man. Now, the Lord made a similar point in, in Mark chapter 9. Uh, there his disciples are arguing who's the greatest. Um, and the Lord says that greatness in the kingdom involves self-sacrificial service toward others. Then in that chapter, he, he takes a child and he puts him in the midst of them there. And he takes the child up in his arms and he, and he says to the disciples, he says, whoever receives a child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now, the point seems to be that a child, though not considered at the time of great value in the world, is of great value as God's image bearer. So greatness in God's estimation involves uh, affording to all human beings the value that he has conferred upon them at creation. Even the child and the poor have inherent value and to demean or despise them in any way is to insult God. Now why does that, why does that matter? Well, hopefully you can see that, that Christianity is here giving a, a solid foundation for the valuing of every human being and for human rights. It doesn't matter if a person is male or female or old or young or rich or poor or healthy or sick or black or white or moral or immoral or religious or irreligious. It doesn't matter the size of the person or their development. It doesn't matter the, the degree of dependency that they have or the environment that, that they live in, every human being possesses intrinsic worth as God's image bearer in this world. Now, an important point just to note there is that the value is intrinsic rather than extrinsic. That means simply that the worth of a human being doesn't lie in what they do, but in what they are. So that a person doesn't have to be successful or beautiful or healthy or, or, or strong or intelligent to be valuable. Uh, every person on God's earth is of great worth and is worthy of respect. A few months ago, I, I had a very interesting conversation with a man who was quite militantly atheistic. Uh, he, 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 he was very much on the attack 
And uh, but at some stage in the, the in the conversation, he he challenged slavery, and he said that the Bible supported it. Now I mentioned that man stealing was expressly forbidden in the Bible, and and I talked a little about about the nature, a little bit about the the nature of slavery in, in the Old Testament. But but at one point I, I said this. I said, listen, I want you to do something for me. I said, I want you to pretend that I am a slave trader who is an atheist. Now, you are an atheist, and I want you to show me why, on your worldview, I should release my slaves. Well, he stuttered and he stumbled. And uh, eventually he said, well, you know, that, that's not really an easy thing to do. And I said, of course it's not. Because in your view, human beings don't possess any intrinsic worth. So why not use them or mistreat them? I mean, if a man has the same worth as a dog or a horse, why not keep the man as a pet or, or use him as a slave? And I then show that Christianity, on the other hand, places upon every human being special value and the maltreatment of any is an insult against the creation, the, the, the creator. Now you can see then that Man being made in the image of God provides a foundation for all sorts of morality and human rights. Um, take even racism, which of course is very uh, a very prominent topic in the news at, at present. Most, most atheists and materialists build their worldview upon Darwinian evolution, the survival of the fittest, and they possess no grounds for objective morality. So their worldview basically declares ultimately that might makes right. Nature has only one commandment, as, as one person has put it, eat or be eaten. Well, that, that's no platform upon which to demolish the sin of racism. Racism is wrong, but only the biblical worldview gives an adequate foundation to, to counter it. So, we thought of man representing God and the, the value of man. I want to move on very quickly to man resembling God and uh, the virtues of man. You see, while man stands positionally in God's image, representing God upon the earth, God has equipped him for the role. Now, it's maybe just important to say here that having all the equipment isn't what makes a person God's representative. A person is God's representative simply because he's created in God's image. He's a human being. So some of the virtues and qualities I'm going to mention here may not be seen to the same degree in every person. But this doesn't change the value of the person. They still stand as God's representative in the world. Now, what, what, what is obvious is that while man is a, a creature, he is not just another part of the machinery. He is distinguished in that, in some senses, he re resembles God. He, he's, not, he's not God. Okay, that's, that's obvious. He's not God, of course, but he's not a dog either, and he's not simply a cog in the machinery of the universe. He has these values and virtues that we're going to, to mention. So in what way does, uh, is man like God? Well, I, I, want, to, I want to think of a, a number of, of features, some of which we've even considered already concerning God, and see how that in a lesser degree or in a slightly different way, they also apply to man, and that uniquely so in creation. So for example, uh, man is eternal. Now, he, he is not eternal in the same sense as God is eternal. God is both beginningless and endless. However, man as a creature cannot be beginningless because he was created. But according to scripture, he is endless. He will exist eternally. He will outlast the universe itself. And in that, he is distinct from all other earthly creatures. Secondly, man is a creator. Now, we know man is a, a creature, and in that sense, the same side as a dog is, but 
He's also a creator, and in that sense, he's in the likeness of God. Uh, if to create is to imagine something in the thought realm and then produce it in the physical world, well, we can do that. We can't do it from nothing as God could, but we can do it. And this brings in the whole sphere of art and music and drama and language and so on. Now, uh, someone might say, well, listen, a, a bee can make a hive and make honey. And uh, a beaver can, can build a dam. Of course, that's true. But, but, but this is important. A, a bee can't learn to build a dam. And the beaver can't learn to build a hive. Whereas a human being watching can learn to do both and can improve upon what has been done. And uh, a human being can also solely in his mind imagine answers to the most complex of problems and then apply them in the real world. And this makes man unique among all biological life forms. Another thing is man is a sovereign. Now, he, he is undoubtedly God's vice regent on the earth. And in the immediate context of man being made in God's image and likeness, we read, let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. And in chapter 2, God entrusts to man, man's care the, the garden and the naming of the animal. So man has a responsibility under God and a rule from God which relates to the inanimate and animal creation. And man feels this responsibility. I mean, there's no other creature who cares about the preserving of, of other species uh, from, from extinction or who cares about ecology or anything like that. So man is a sovereign. Man is a communicator. In a special way, language is a part of man's creativity and it's necessary for the full enjoyment of relationship which uh, is foundational then to personality. Uh, Donald Williams noted uh, about language he said you don't have to be a great verbal artist. The mere fact that you're able to speak at all makes you a creative genius. Language is one of the most amazing evidences of human creativity and this, this aligns with what we know of God in Genesis chapter 1. The first thing we can't help noticing about God is that he creates. And the second is that he does so by articulating and God saying. Now, someone may again protest that animals have some means of communication. But the quality of communication is, is, just can't be compared. Um, animals don't make up new signs with new meanings to convey new thoughts or abstract thoughts. As human beings create language spontaneously and, uh, and they, they, they use it to communicate to other human beings ideas and concepts previously unknown to that other human being. Now, think about what I am doing presently. It's possible that there's someone listening who hasn't ever really thought about the image of God in man and yet I'm communicating this to you simply by the use of language and all of a sudden I am invading your mind with thoughts and uh, something of of my personality is being communicated and uh, there's a com there, there, there's a relationship that results from that and uh, God confirmed this unique character of man not only by commanding him to do certain things, but by conversing with him in these chapters. Uh, another thing is man is volitional. Just as God expressed the ability to make a free choice in creation, as we thought at the beginning of the week, so man expressed that same ability when, for example, he created the names for the animals, uh, when he chose to disobey God. Uh, so alone among all of creation, God singled out man to give an option to him. In Genesis 2, he makes a commandment. He tells Adam of the consequence of disobeying that. And then he leaves Adam with a choice. And we know that Adam made the wrong choice. I, I think Francis Schaeffer has, has put this helpfully. He said, to ask that man 
should have been made so that he was not able to revolt is to ask that God's creation should have ceased after he created plants and animals. It is to ask that man should be reduced to machine programming. It is to ask that man as man should not exist. So it's important to see that God's sovereignty, even at creation, was not threatened by man's free choice. God's ultimate control is not challenged by our personal choices. Now, um, we're going to have to come to a conclusion. We'll do one more. Man is relational. Uh, Paul emphasized yesterday the triunity of God and showing God to be essentially rela relational. Uh, God is love, and the love that marks God essentially and eternally is a love that focuses upon others, other members of the Godhead. It is the volitional blessing of other persons, and this has been the, the fellowship within God eternally. So divine love is the very opposite of self-centeredness or self-absorption. Um, C.S. Lewis said that the persons within God exult, commune with, and defer to one another. Each divine person harbors the other at the center of his being. So a loving community relationship is at the foundation of reality. And man is likewise made for relationship. First, for relationship with God, and then for relationship with others at the same level as himself in society. It's not good that the man should be alone. And then, of course, there's a, a downward relationship as well to creation. So uh, the image of God gives a person value. The likeness of God gives person uh, virtues. And uh, I think that rather than me going on any further, I'm just going to have to conclude there and uh, trust that the Lord will, will, will bless what we have said to us all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Good to see you. And we'll read from Genesis 1, uh, verse 26 to verse 31. Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Uh, over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. When we say that God is good, uh, there are two things uh, that could be understood. We could be meaning uh, one of two things, or perhaps both of these things when we say that God is good. We could be saying, uh, we could be making this statement that God is good within himself. That is, he is intrinsically good. Or we could be uh, expressing this, that God is good to us. That is, he is 
extrinsically good. Uh, he's beneficent. He benefits us. And of course, both of these things are true. Um, both of these things are worth considering. And that's what we're going to be thinking about for the remainder of our time this morning as we think about the goodness of God. So I want us to think, first of all, about how God is intrinsically good. That is, God being good means that he is morally perfect. Uh, he is absolutely morally good. And this, just like the truth of his love, is founded upon the fact that God is triune. It is because God is a trinity, it's because God exists eternally in relationship, in community, that that means that God is essentially a moral being. He is eternally, essentially good. When we say that God is good, we're not saying that God conforms to a standard of goodness outside himself. It's not that there is a standard of goodness uh, that God has to conform to. It's not that there is a rule that God has to obey. Now, when we say that God is good, what we are saying is he is the standard of goodness. Now, I put to you that this really makes no sense if God was a Unitarian kind of a being, if God was just a single person. It would make no sense to say that he is within himself the standard of goodness. Uh, it would mean that something is good merely because God says so. No. When we say God is good, what we're saying is that good reflects the way God is within his own nature, within the nature of God. The persons of the Godhead interact with each other in perfect love, uh, just as David uh, reminded us of that quote from C.S. Lewis. Uh, the persons of the Godhead regard each other with perfect love. And so goodness isn't just what God says. Goodness is the way God is within the being of God. There is this perfect love and regard for each other uh, so that there is then a foundation for morality. Uh, so just then to return to a question that was asked yesterday about why the Trinity matters, the fact is if you pull away at the thread of uh, the, the truth of the Trinity, absolutely everything unravels. Uh, if there is no triune God, then there is no love. If there is no triune God, then there is no goodness. Uh, so you just think about those things. Uh, if there's no triune God, there's no love. What that means is there's no provision of salvation. But if you pull away at the Trinity, then it means there is actually no moral goodness. Which means there's not only is there no provision of salvation, there's no necessity for salvation uh, because we don't have a God who is absolutely good. We don't have a God who is righteous and holy, uh, which means then that there is no necessity for our salvation. God is good within himself. Uh, God is absolutely morally Perfect. And what that means then is that God cannot act unrighteously. Uh, God cannot set aside the demands of his law. His moral perfection is something that is essential to his nature, and his law flows from his nature. So, uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, he asked 
the, the question or, or made the, the statement. He says, if God wants to forgive people, why can't he just forgive them? Uh, why does he need to sacrifice himself in order to forgive people? And, of course, uh, Richard Dawkins, he was voted one of the top three intellectuals in the world at one stage. And uh, I don't think it'll surprise you to, to learn I wasn't one of the other two in that vote. But I can answer Richard Dawkins' question. He says, why can't God just forgive people? And the answer is because he couldn't justly forgive people. Uh, God can't just turn a blind eye to the issue of sin, because to do so would be a denial of his moral perfection. Those who say that God wouldn't send them to hell because he is good have actually hit on the reason why God must send unrepentant sinners to hell. Uh, it is because he is good. And a good God does not and cannot let sin into his presence. He cannot abide sin. Sin must be punished uh, by him. Sin must be banished from him. And so those who think that the goodness of God means that there can't be a hell uh, have got it exactly in reverse. The goodness of God means there must be a hell. There must be banishment and punishment of sin. And I think that does, um, that, that is expressed by people in their unguarded moments. Uh, when they look at evil in the world and they say something like, why would God allow that? And they think that God uh, not acting, God not intervening, God not doing something about the evil in the world, they think that reflects badly on the goodness of God. They're saying, surely if there's a good God, he's going to do something about that. Similarly, when people think of uh, someone who has done evil and um, uh, they, they, the person has uh, died before they could face justice, what people long for is that there is an afterlife when that person gets what they deserve. Uh, they, they want damnation for that person. They recognize that is good and just, that that person should be punished. It is bad and wrong to think of that person escaping without punishment. So uh, the goodness of God uh, is based on the fact that God is a trinity. The goodness of God uh, leads then to the conclusion that there must be punishment for sin. God is good intrinsically. But let's think then about how God is good extrinsically. That is, he's not just good within himself. He's not just morally perfect, but he is good to us. And this is something that is brought out over and over again in this first chapter of Genesis. As you read uh, these statements, uh, statements like this, it was good. God bless them. Of every tree, thou mayest freely eat. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God made a good, a very good creation, and he put Adam and Eve in that world of beauty and goodness. And uh, he didn't say to them, now look, you're in a world of beauty and goodness, but don't touch, don't enjoy. No, he put them in that world and God blessed them. And God said, of every tree, thou mayest freely eat, with that one exception. Uh, so he didn't put them into a beautiful world and say, now look, I don't want you to enjoy it. 
uh, I don't want you to appreciate it. No, you see, some people uh, do have this idea that it is wrong to enjoy this work. Uh, and in fact, that was uh, an error that arose in the early days of Christianity. And you find a different in different letters of the New Testament, this error is confronted. Uh, you can find it being confronted in the book of Colossians or in Paul's first letter to Timothy in chapter four. Uh, there were those who thought that the material world was by definition sinful and stained and defiled. And they had this idea of God uh, in his transcendence not being able to have anything to do with the physical creation. Well, if you think of the, the book of Colossians, Paul uh, counters this error by showing that the physical creation uh, God created, God created that this wasn't done by some um, lower, lesser agent. No, God created the physical world. Furthermore, God entered the physical world and God will reconcile the physical world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, in, uh, at the end of that chapter, in a context in which Paul is saying to the Corinthians, look, you don't have to align yourself with certain teachers to the exclusion of others. What he says to him is this, he says, all things are yours. He's saying, look, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter, look, we're all, all are there for your benefit. But he goes on to say, all things are yours, the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And what he's saying is all these things are available for you, for your good, for your enjoyment. So uh, just like the body, we are also to care for the soul. You see, there are some people who, who think that Yes, it's right to feed the spirit. Uh, that is, we're to enjoy the Bible and to experience fellowship with God and feed the spirit. And we're to feed the body. We have to feed the body and take in food uh, for our sustenance and so on. Uh, so it's right to feed the spirit. It's right to feed the body. But we have to starve the soul. Uh, that emotional aspect of our being. We're to starve that. Uh, so we're not to enjoy the beauty of creation or you're not to enjoy uh, art or humor or anything like that. Now, that is a denial of the way God made us and it is a rejection of his good creation. Worldliness is not enjoying the world. That's not what worldliness is. Uh, some people maybe have that very kind of simplistic idea of worldliness. So uh, if you enjoy the world and if you enjoy things that are produced in this world uh, for our emotional satisfaction, people think that's very worldly. No, worldliness isn't enjoying the world but rather worldliness is enjoying the world at the expense of or to the exclusion of God. It's being taken up with the gifts to the exclusion of the giver. Now that's what happened in Eden. That's what happened at the fall. Uh, Eve got taken up with something in the world and uh, she she turned against the giver. And uh, John brings out a, a similar kind of thing in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And he speaks about 
uh, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And there's a very definite parallel with Genesis chapter 3. But uh, what, what John is saying there is this, uh, that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is, if the world is your ultimate good, if the world is the thing that you place the supreme value on, if you're enjoying the world to the exclusion of God, uh, well, then that is worldliness. No, what we are to do is to see that the world isn't the greatest good. It doesn't have the supreme value. Uh, it's not the ultimate thing uh, in, in the universe. No, the, the world is a gift from God the Creator, and it is to be received as a gift in gratitude and to be enjoyed in fellowship with the Creator. If I give a gift to my child, the intention is that the child will enjoy that gift in gratitude to me, and that the giving of that gift will bring me and my son into a closer relationship and uh, it will increase his love for me and his appreciation uh, and our fellowship will be deep but if the child takes the gift and uh, runs away with the gift just to enjoy the gift and never to have any regard for me that is a picture of and that is the essence of worldliness no, the, the Bible says that we are to enjoy the things of this world as a gift from God. James says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above uh, and cometh down from the Father of lights. And so this, I, I think, uh, opens, uh, opens the door to great joy and delight, uh, where we can actually see that every good thing that there is in the world around us, it is, as it were, offered to us on the hand of God. So uh, the, the Lord Jesus, he says in Luke chapter 12, uh, he says, consider the raven. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God then so clothes the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, the, the point I want to get across is this, and if you enjoy this half as much as, I, as I've enjoyed it, I, you'll enjoy it. The, the point I want to get across to you is this. Listen to how the Lord Jesus speaks. God feeds the ravens. God clothes the lilies it's god who does this so there isn't this we we um sometimes uh can divide things into uh you know an act of god and then there's natural causes but the lord jesus says right when it comes to natural causes what i want to do is just skip out all the intermediate steps and see that behind it all there is god who clothed or who fed the israelites in their journey through the wilderness you say well god fed them i mean he just rained bread from heaven there it was god fed them well the point is this god feeds you he uses steps in between he uses people he uses channels but as one writer tim chester said he, he put it like this but in fact everything is an act of god sometimes god acts directly in what we call miracles 
And sometimes God acts indirectly through intermediate causes, which we call natural causes. But everywhere, our Heavenly Father is at work. So every good thing that you have and enjoy, this is a gift to you from God. So the tastes of food and the sights of beauty and the sound of a beautiful piece of music or the sound of a baby giggling or the fragrance of flowers or the feel of starched sheets in your bed or the majesty of mountains and rivers or the engineering of an ankle or the technology of eyes or the genius of the vascular system in plants or all of these things that you find in the world things that can make you weep with joy or laugh with glee. All of these things are gifts from God. All of these things are evidences of his goodness. All of these things are to be received with thanks. So when you see uh, a, a, a beautiful uh, landscape, when you see a beautiful piece of art, you don't just give praise to the artist, but you give praise to the supreme artist who has made the artist in his likeness, as David has been reminded, reminding us, has made, the, has made man with the capacity to produce beauty like this. When you listen to music that thrills you, you don't just praise the composer, but you praise the God who created music and created man in his likeness with the ability to do such things. When you see a wonderful work of engineering in this world, you don't just give credit to the engineer, but you give credit to the supreme engineer the God who has invested humanity with the capacity for such things. So what this means is there is evidence of the goodness of God everywhere. It, all around you, just at this moment, you, there is with, within your reach, there are all sorts of wonderful gifts from God. God is good to you. Uh, you lie in your bed at night. And isn't it wonderful to lie in a bed? This is a gift from God. You go out and you feel the sun on your cheek. Isn't God good? There's, there's water that falls from the sky. And often we complain about it, especially in Northern Ireland. But isn't it an amazing thing that water actually falls from the sky? This thing that gives and sustains life, and there it is falling from the sky above us. Isn't it wonderful that grass is green? Isn't it great that the sky is blue? Listen, the world didn't have to be as beautiful as it is. Things didn't have to be as good as it Food didn't have to taste good. You know, we could just, God didn't have to give us taste buds. All of these things are evidences of the goodness of God. But we need to remember the gifts. The gifts aren't the ultimate thing. The giver is. And so we are not to be like the heathen that Paul refers to in Romans 1 who were not thankful. I remember hearing the story of a, a boy brought up in a Christian home and uh, he went to his friend's house and his friend, uh, that wasn't a Christian family. He was there for tea and the tea was put on the table and everyone just fell upon it and uh, started to eat. And the boy was just sitting there looking quite puzzled. And he says, that's what my dog does. Uh, just dive on the food without giving God thanks. Now, the thing is, it, it's part of our... Uh, culture and makeup and upbringing, it's ingrained in us to give thanks for food, but aren't there so many things that we just take for granted? 
so many gifts that we receive without giving God thanks. And let us remember as well, there are all these good and wonderful gifts around us, but let's remember the most valuable gifts. Uh, let's not let's not just say, right, well, God has given us this world to enjoy, so I'm going to enjoy it to the full. Let's be prepared to sacrifice lesser gifts for greater gifts. I remember hearing Charles Findall say that uh, there are only two things in this world that last forever, people and the word of God. And that tells you where you should be investing your time. Uh, let's make sure that we're investing in those gifts that actually last forever. God is good. How good is the God we adore? Now let's give thanks and ask his blessing on us. Our God and Father, we do give thanks to thee for thy goodness shown to us in so many ways. We think of the extravagance uh, of thy gifts and we're overwhelmed uh, as we consider all of these things. We are immensely blessed and we want to acknowledge thee as a good God and pray that thou wilt help us uh, then to be grateful for all the things that thou has given us. We give thanks for our time together. Uh, we give thanks for creating us in thine image and likeness. We thank thee for the uh, capacities that we have uh, that enable us to relate to thee. It's a, a wonderful thing to be human. And uh, we uh, bow in gratitude for the privilege and honor and dignity conferred upon us. And uh, pray that these things will enlarge uh, our appreciation and enrich our vision of thee, our God. We commit us to thee now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.